First of all, Vita, we owe you a very big thank you. And I told her when I spoke to her earlier on the phone, I get even emotional about it because she has been such a wonderful steward, she and her organization, of this very beautiful building. And those of us who are in the Friends of B'nai Abraham who work to restore this building back to its beautiful form are so happy that you have taken it over and are treating it with the respect that we hoped somebody would so that this building will be here now for future generations to, take, to enjoy. And thank you. Let me, let me give, it, give you a little of my background because I am not from the Iron Range, but I am an adopted Iron Ranger. This is my favorite part of the state of Minnesota. There is no other place like it. I was asked by a historian who was writing an up-to-date history of Minnesota. He was asking me about the state. And I said, well, you know, Minnesota, everybody eats white bread in Minnesota, except on the Iron Range. I said, on the Iron Range, they eat rye and pumpernickel. And that's why I love it up here, because there is so much diversity, so much variety. Today, I was driving through Virginia and Eveleth and Hibbing, looking at your churches, because your churches represent this great diversity that's part of this region. And I love it for that. But I became interested in this. Hmm. I'm only 39, but I got interested in it about 55 years ago, actually. Uh, my husband had a family in Hibbing. I don't know if any of you know the Jalowski family. And I came up to Hibbing to, uh, my husband and I had gotten married, to visit the family. And I'm an architectural historian, that's my profession, and my area is primarily religious art and architecture. And I was astonished to know that at one time there were four Jewish congregations up on the Iron Range. Because I had always been told, well, there were Jews in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and you know, sprinkling up in Duluth. But nobody ever talked about the Jews on the Iron Range. Oh, yes, they were there, but they didn't say that they had established stable communities there that actually formed four congregations. So I asked my husband, I said, I gotta go see their synagogues. Well, I don't have to tell you what I felt when I saw this one. It was like discovering gold. It was, really? In Virginia, Minnesota, you've got this beautiful, beautiful building? Well, I was teaching at the University of Minnesota in the 80s and 90s, and I wanted to get the students out of the classroom, you know, out of, you know, using secondary sources, going to the library to do their research. And I thought, you know, how about if I did a project with you know, upper division and graduate students, bringing them up to this wonderful area of Minnesota to do research, and to research the history of the Jewish community, of the people who settled here, and of their neighbors, not just on the Jews, but on their neighbors as well. And I got a lot of interest. And in fact, I got enough funding from the university for several years to bring a group of students up here. And they, I don't know, they may have interviewed some of, you know, this was in the 80s. They were interviewing some of the original settlers still were alive. We did over, I think, about 150 oral interviews. We documented these, the buildings, the four buildings that still survive. We took photographs, we found photographs, we went through the newspaper archives. And my research assistant, Chester Prochan, actually wrote his doctoral dissertation on the Jews of the Iron Range. And I think there is a copy available. Uh, Harry Lampa has a copy, so it might be at the Virginia Area Historical Society. But the last years I was up here, it became very apparent the synagogue was in trouble. You know, the population was declining, people were moving away. I don't have to help tell you people what was happening at the Iron Range at this time. The building got placed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is no small feat. This is very difficult. It is the only synagogue in the state of Minnesota that's on the National Register of Historic Places. You should be very proud of that because that means it's got national recognition. In fact, when I was asked to write a book on America's religious architecture for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, this building is in it. I made certain this building was going to be in it. 
so it's gotten, and I, so I realized that this building was in trouble, so I started making a little bit of trouble myself, trying to make people recognize we've got to do something about this building. You know, it's soon going to be vacant, what's going to be its future, and what's going to happen to it? Well, I even got, it even went national on AP, the story about this synagogue. I don't know if you folks even realize that. You got national attention, Virginia, Minnesota, in this little building. And it also got the attention of the Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest that had just been formed. And one of the members, Margie Ostroff, sitting right here, contacted me and said, mm, we got to do something about this building. Well, thanks to the efforts of people like Margie, the friends of the B'nai Abraham were formed. And some of these friends are here. And these are the people who worked literally the butts off to raise the money. How much did you raise? Over $600,000. <laughs> Let me recognize that Margie was our president, Margie Ostroff. Now, these names, some of them are going to be familiar. Her husband, Dr. Charles Ostroff, was our treasurer. Uh, my nephew, Larry Shiat, who was married to Elaine Deutsch Shiat, the name is familiar, I'm sure, was one of our legal advisors. Alan Milovitz, who the Milovitz name is scattered throughout the synagogue, was another one of our and by legal advisors. And his mother-in-law, who is over there, Nancy Stone, is from Natchwalk. So the Iron Range has stayed within the family. But these are the folks that we all owe a great deal of thanks to because they worked hard for almost 20 years to make certain that this building was not only restored to its original appearance, but restored according to the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which says quite a bit as well. So, thank you. So now you got a little background on how I became, I was on also on the board of the Friends, and it was with a great deal of pride and happiness that I was. How many of you have been in a synagogue before? Well, a lot of you have, but how many of you understand what you're seeing here and understand what a synagogue is? I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about that because we, you know, a Jewish house of worship is not a church. I had a hard time telling the Minnesota Historical Society that because when I first began to do research on this congregation and I went to the Minnesota Historical Society, this is card catalog time in the 1980s, I'm looking up I knew their records were there. I'm looking up the Abraham Synagogue. Couldn't find it. So I went to the archivist. I said, where will I find all the material on the Abraham Synagogue? Under churches. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. <laughs> that, that is not where the material should be. But let me just tell you, the word synagogue that we use to identify a Jewish house of worship is Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's not Yiddish, it's Greek. And what the word simply means is to gather. Just as we are doing today, this is a place of gathering. It's a place for people to come together. A synagogue is a multifunctional building. We gather together to pray. We gather together to, strength, to study. We gather together to celebrate. It's an idea of gathering. And what was unique and why it's Greek is because synagogues began to evolve when the Jews no longer had their temple. It was destroyed, as you know, by the Romans in the year of the 70 of the Common Era. And they wanted a place where they could still come together to study Torah, the five books of Moses, and to pray. But the concept of congregational worship was, was that there in the ancient world. People didn't congregate to worship. They stood outside of a temple and went to witness the sacrifice or something similar. So this whole idea of gathering came out of necessity. The Christians followed that as did the Muslims. But the initiate, how it initiated was because of a need, a need that was necessary. So we're gathering here today to celebrate to celebrate this building, 
the fact it's been restored, the fact that it's being reused in an appropriate way. Now, synagogues throughout the world, whether they were built 1,800 years ago or whether they were built yesterday, have certain features you will find regardless of where you go. One of them is a cabinet. We call it a Ron HaKodesh, the Holy Ark. Every synagogue has a cabinet like this. It might not look like this, but it's similar. This one has the Lions of Judah on the top there, and the first words of the Ten Commandments, in, as you can see, right up above there. The Ark has what we call a power coat, a hanging in front of it. And that hanging is over the doors that I'll talk about in a minute, but it has the crown. That is the crown of Torah, the crown of the five books of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the Star of David, and of course, a dedication of the people who donated it. But in that cabinet was kept the Torah scroll, and you can see mock-ups. Those are not real Torah scrolls because they would not be displayed like that. But it shows you the covering that was put. The scrolls, they're literally scrolls. They're written on parchment, and they contain the five books of Moses. Now, yesterday was the Sabbath. The, it, the Torah is, owned, is stored in this cabinet. It's only taken out three days a week to be read. Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and on certain holidays. Why on Saturday? Obviously, it's the Sabbath. But why Monday and Thursday? Because in antiquity, those were the market days. That's when people were in town. That's when people gathered. So naturally, that's the day you would take the scrolls out to teach. Now, yesterday, if you went into a synagogue here, or in Bangkok, or in London, or anywhere in the world, they would be reading the same portion of the Torah scroll. We're on the book of Deuteronomy now, the last book, because our new year is coming on September 6th. So we're reading Deuteronomy, and in this part of Deuteronomy we're reading, they're talking, Moses is explaining to the Jewish people what the Ten Commandments are all about. So there is this amazing sense of continuity. Because if I was born 1,800 years ago and walked to in a synagogue yesterday, I would have been reading that same part of Deuteronomy. And I would have seen a same cabinet. And I would have seen, you see that lamp hanging there? It's a ner tamid. It's an eternal light. Every cynic never turned off. It symbolizes the menorah, the seven branch, not the eight branch menorah that once stood in Solomon's temple. The central light that is flanked by three lights, the light of God. You will, every synagogue will have an eternal light burning. So you'll understand next time you go in, and as far as the architecture, whatever. Uh, the synagogue in, Ev in Eveleth and the synagogue in Hibbing. The one in Eveleth was a Polish Catholic church originally. The one in Hibbing was a Swedish Lutheran church. Uh, the congregations bought them, moved them to new sites, and what I always tell people is they circumcised them. <laughs> what do I mean by that? What did you think they removed from those churches? The tower. <laughs> so it was the only thing that had to be done because then they could move in the cabinet where the altar or the pulpit once was, and you, guess what? You have a gathering place. You have a synagogue. So you'll see synagogues in a variety of architectural styles. Stained glass windows, mm, not always. It's a 19th century introduction, and, and it actually comes from church architecture. Uh, you know, why not? But these, of course, have special symbols in them. On your far left, you have that seven branch menorah. And you see the three flanking the central one. Now, if you look at that, the number three, I know it's significant in Christianity, the Trinity, right? But it's an ancient number that always symbolized perfection. Why? It's the only number that has a beginning, 
a middle, and an end. And the number seven has always been also since antiquity. Why? Because going back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they knew astronomy. They knew there were five planets in the sun and the moon, the number seven. So the menorah is really perfection surrounding the oneness of God. So that's that symbol. This one is very interesting. You don't often find it in synagogues. Noah's Ark. Uh, I talked to one of my colleagues who has documented literally thousands of synagogue stained glass windows, and you can count on one hand how many have Noah's Ark. I said, I think the reason they chose Noah's Ark is because these people came across the ocean to this land. This was the Golden Medina, the land of promise and that represents the journey they took. This looks like a bishop's mitre, but actually it's the mitre that the high priest, Aaron, wore in the temple. And when you look in the back, when you see the coverings of the Torah scrolls, they were covered in beautiful gowns, we called it, similar to what the high priest would wear in the temple. So everything here has a meaning. That is the Torah scroll, opened, closed. And you know, we never touch it. When we read from that Torah scroll, we use a pointer, and you'll see some silver ones back there, because it is so sacred to us that we would never think of touching it with our fingers. You'll try to read it. It's written all in Hebrew with no vowels. Try thinking, reading English with no vowels. <laughs> and our children by the age of 13 are expected to get in front of the congregation and to do that. So again, this long sense of continuity. But I wanted to kind of introduce you to this building. Uh, Nita asked if I was going to use slides. I said, I don't need to use slides. <laughs> We're right in this wonderful building that tells the whole story I want to talk about as far as what this building represents. And I'll tell you something else. This building is very highly visible, isn't it, it's on this corner. That says so much about the Jewish community on the range and the fact it felt confident enough Think about it, in 1909 they built this building. They felt confident enough to build this beautiful red brick building with stained glass windows that your newspaper, your Virginia newspaper had on its headline, the finest church on the Iron Range dedicated today. <laughs> well, we try, you know. <laughs> but regardless. But you know, going back to what I was saying about the Iron Range of my, my long love affair with it. I want to read, oh, what did I do with it? I have to read a quote to you, and I hope, yep, it's here. Because this, to me, represents the Iron Range and what my work is in trying to document houses of worship. Because I don't just work with synagogues. I work with churches. I work with all historic religious properties, trying to make people recognize these buildings are books. They have stories to tell. And it's my responsibility to help you read this book and understand it and know what it represents in your community. You know, the folks who came to this country didn't have a lot of money. They couldn't, as individuals, make a statement and say, I'm Serbian or I'm Croatian. But they could do it as a group, as a congregation in the church they built. And that's what I mean about these. So let me read you. This is a quote from Hubert H. Humphrey. He gave a speech when he was vice president to a group of Orthodox rabbis in New York City. I, I have this in my, actually in two of the books I've written, because I think it's such a great quote. Some see the United States as a vast melting pot where our particular ethnic traditions are submerged and forgotten. I prefer to celebrate this nation as a vast tapestry where each group of Americans contributes its own brilliant color to the magnificent mosaic of American life. What is the Iron Range? It's a mosaic, is it not? And part of that mosaic, part of that brilliant color was indeed provided by those Jewish immigrants 
who came and settled here. The question was, I had my students ask as we were interviewing people, how did your family know about the Iron Range? I mean, you know, back in, when the two, you know, both the Vermilion and the Mesabi you know, Iron Ranges were open, 1882, 1892, this was quite a remote area. The weather wasn't really what you would call ideal to attract people. Uh, you know, it was a little bit distance from any urban center. How in the heck did Eastern European Jews coming from Lithuania, for gosh sakes, know about the Iron Range? Most of the answers that we got was, well, one of my family's relatives came here and settled and then brought over the rest of the family. Yes, but how did that relative get here in the first place? We haven't found that person yet. But what we do know is that two events occurred that were contemporary in two different parts of the world that really propelled Jews to come to America and for a 1,000 of them, there were 1,000 here by 1910 on the Iron Range, 121 in Virginia if you want exact numbers. But there were, how, how, what happened? Well, here on the Iron, you know, the forests were cut down, you know, the Native Americans out sadly were forced to flee. And what was exposed? Hmm. Red earth, iron ore, right? Well, once the blast furnace was invented, this iron ore then could be processed into steel. First the Vermilion Range opened, and then the Wasabi Range, 1882, 1891. What did the mining companies have to do? They had to find workers, right? So what did the mining companies do? They went to Southern and Eastern Europe, and they recruited, didn't they, young men to come here and work in the mines for all, what was it, a dollar and a quarter a day? <laughs> but things were difficult in Europe at this time. People were starving. It was overpopulated. So this looked like the Golden Medina. And for many of the young men who came here, and many of them came, not as families, they saw this as an opportunity to make a few dollars, save up some money, go back to the old country, and maybe buy a piece of land, get married and settle. Well, in 1881, all the way on the other side of the world, another event was happening at the same time. Tsar Alexander II, the Tsar of the Russian Empire, was assassinated in St. Petersburg. And guess who was blamed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Jews at that time could not live in Mother Russia. They were living in what was called the Pale of Settlement. These were the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, parts of Poland, parts of Romania. This was part of the world. They, and they only could live if it was in a town. They had to live in a shtetl, it was called, a certain town. If they lived in a larger urban area like Vilnius or Krovno in Lithuania, they had to live in a ghetto. Just if they were isolated. Well, the Jews who came to the Iron Range, 90% of them, more than 90% of them, and as I'm looking at a Milovitz and a Deutsch and a, and a Stone, they came from Lithuania. They came from Kovno and they came from Vilnius, where my maternal grandparents also came from. They were Lithuanians, but not citizens. They had no civil rights. I don't know if folks are aware of it. But the Jews living in the Pale of Settlement had no civil rights. They couldn't own land. They couldn't join guilds to learn a trade. So guess what they became? Merchants. Because what do farmers and what do carpenters and what do bricklayers need? Merchandise. So they became the middleman. They became the merchants. And they learned how to deal with, merchand with merchandise. So the Jews are blamed for the assassination of the Tsar by his son, Tsar Alexander III, and he allowed these pogroms. Have you ever heard that term before? These were violent uprisings against the Jews. Uh, their sons were being uh, drafted for 25 years of military service. It wasn't that bad, but 
God knows, terrible. So two and a half million Jews between 1881 and 1924, when immigration was closed for everybody, except if you were a good Northern European, uh, was not allowed into this country. Two and a half million Jews. Well, most of them settled, as we know, along the East Coast in ghettos. Few of them drifted a little further west, Philadelphia, Chicago. Minneapolis opened up, that's when my paternal grandfather, who came actually from outside of St. Petersburg, drifted up to Minneapolis in about 1890 or so. But many of them became peddlers, or they became, to quote one rabbi, the first environmentalist. Why did he say that? Because they became rag pickers and junk dealers. Think about it. They used to go through the countryside, peddle their goods, and at the same time, if you had a rusty tractor or a rusty whatever, they would pick that up. So they made a few dollars, but they also became very aware when new towns were beginning to develop. Aha, uh -huh. a new town is developing. What is that new town going to need? I, I'm not a miner. I, don't, I can't be a farmer. I don't have any training as a bricklayer or as a carpenter. I can be a merchant in that town. I have a few bucks. I can get some goods. And this is the story of how a few Jews drifting through Minnesota, probably as peddlers, or they might have been in La Crosse, Wisconsin, or they might have been in Minneapolis, and somebody said, hey, you know, there's nothing for you here, but you know, we heard up north, you know, if you feel like it, you know, go up there. There might be something, you know, you can do up there. The Milovitzes were one of those families. The Stones, or Somal Salomonovich, was one of those families, Naomi's family, the Edelsteins, my, my niece Elaine's family. They were some of those families. Look at the names around here. You'll see the Shandlings were one of those families. The Romans were one of those families. They drifted into this area. They had a few dollars. They would maybe open a store, as Ben Stone did in 1905, in a location right outside of Hibbing. But you know what was interesting about the Jewish immigrants who came here? They came as family units because they didn't have a homeland to return to. They didn't have a place where they could save a few bucks and go buy a piece of land and get married. And for many of them, the idea of going and living in a ghetto in a big eastern city really wasn't very attractive either. And to be very blunt, Minneapolis was one of the most anti-Semitic cities in the nation. Jews were not comfortable. They lived there. St. Paul wasn't, it was Minneapolis. So they drifted up to Duluth, and from Duluth they drifted, and by 1910, as I said, there were 120 Jews living here in Virginia. In 1905, they formed a congregation, and they pooled their money just like every other immigrant group who settled here did, and they built their synagogues. And they became the merchants on Main Street in all of the towns. Let me just read you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful book, The Color of Masabi Bones. Good. I'm not selling it. I don't even know the author, but I was told about it. I bought it. It is, isn't it wonderful, his poetry? Let me read you a little bit of what he wrote because he says it better than I can say it. What's his name? John Caddy is the author, and it was published by, I think, one of the local presses. It's not a new book, it's been around for a while. In my, uh, it's Milkweed Editions, John Caddy, C-A-D-D-Y. I think he lives in Duluth. And I think it was published about 10 years ago. But I'm going to read this to you. It's from a narrative. This isn't a poem. It's from something called Mind Town, M-I-N-E, Mind Town, knowing where you're at. He saw nation in every cheekbone, every movement of the lip. Pop Scheibel, is that name familiar to many of you? Stood in front of palace clothing. Some of you know that, it was on Chestnut Street. Greeting all in their mother tongues. Saw a nation in a walk, 
the way a scarf or a babushka was worn, and knew which of his seven tongues to greet. He apprenticed in Helsinki and Riga, Malmo and St. Petersburg, and at none of them could he own land. Pops knew all these sons and daughters of hard rock miners who drilled underground in Budapest and Cornwall and Helsinki before they came across in the 1880s and 90s, jostling sons and daughters of the Canuck and Swede and Yank loggers who stayed to finish off the pine. Knew the steerage families from Italy and Montenegro, Finland and the Ukraine who came later with sharp elbows and notes on their clothes. Knew the Greeks, the Irish, the Baltic Jews, the Chinese. Doesn't that say, tell you, isn't that it? Isn't that who you guys are? All of you? Yeah, yeah. Well, Pop Schreiber, as you know, had his store on Main Street. And when I was here 40 years ago interviewing, we spoke to one elderly Finnish woman and we asked, because he had a sign, the, the brothers, they were two, in, in their store in Finnish, in which he said, come and shop in the Finnish boy's store. We speak Finnish, you know, in asking the miners to come. Well, this one woman said, oh, yes, they, they did speak Finnish, but they spoke big city Finnish because they lived in Helsinki. We're just farm folk. We spoke rural Finnish. They wanted to make that clear to me. But you know, there were 25 different ethnic and national groups who settled on the range, 25. The rest of Minnesota is either Scandinavian, it's either Norwegian or Swedish or German, right? Three. <laughs> Here you've got 25 of you. I, I find that absolutely remarkable. But the Jews, as I said, came here, they became merchants, and they brought their families. The range generally, the, the women, the men outnumbered the women almost over two to one, because there were so many, well, you know all the rooming houses that are still evident around here. But the Jews, it, it was almost even, because as soon as they came here, if they weren't married, they were going to find somebody and marry them. And that's what happened to Ben Solomonovich, who changed his name to Ben Stone, a lot easier to pronounce. And he married Libba Edelstein. Now, the name Libba has to be familiar to those of you from Virginia. What was the name of your movie theater on Chestnut Street? Libba with two Yeah. <laughs> Named after your great-grandmother, right? <laughs> Exactly. He married Libba Edelstein, and they had a little store on the, in a location. I'm going to kind of tell you their story because the arc of their lives reflects the arc of so many of the Jewish people who came here, except for one very important difference that I'll give you. So Libba and Ben get married, and they have a daughter named Florence Edelstein. And Florence marries, now I gotta get all of this straight. Florence marries, who, who does Florence marry? Uh, oh, she marries Ben Stone, how could I? No, she marries Ben? Salamavich. Which one? Salamavich. Salamavich, yeah, okay. Florence actually, yeah, marries Ben, yeah, that's right. And, Florence is the daughter of Ben, Ben's, oh God, I'll get this all straight. Ben Edelstein, ah, Ben and Libba Edelstein, because there were two Bens. Okay, Florence marries Ben Stone, all right. And they have four children, two girls and two boys, okay. And the Stone family have or the Elsie family have the movie theaters. They have the State Theater in Hibbing. Where is the State Theater? I was just in Hibbing, it's gone. <laughs> that was a beautiful theater. I've seen pictures of it. You guys took it down. And what is now well, the Mac Mako or Mako in, uh, in uh, Virginia on Chestnut Street. So they, they did okay, you know, they then, was able to open another store in Hibbing. He kept the one in the location, 
Florence lived there. They lived upstairs of the store. This was not unusual. They didn't have money. You lived in the back of the store. You lived upstairs of the store. And then when you were able to get a little money, what did you do? You bought a house. And that's where their four children were born. Now, one thing about the range that I always told my students is, this is not a backwater area. They had the finest educational system in the state of Minnesota was up here on the Iron Range. They had the best teachers because they paid them more than any other teachers. They had the best schools because the mining companies were told if they didn't pay taxes, then they would have to put the money into education. But the mining companies also had another reason for doing that. Let's face it, the mining companies were owned and operated by not Southern and Eastern Europeans, not by people from the Balkans. <laughs> they were owned and operated by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, let's just say it. <laughs> and they kind of looked at the Jews and the, and the Orthodox Christians and the Catholics as lacking the moral values of America, that they had to be introduced to American values. And one way was to Americanize them was through the schools. Another way was to encourage them to become Protestants. That did not work too well. <laughs> and very few of them actually did, but at least they tried. And they actually also, and this is a kind of a paradox, as many of you know, they funded the churches too. They helped pay for some of the churches. Why? Because that would instill moral values into these people who obviously, by their standards, they figured were lacking them. How little they understood about these immigrant groups, right? And how little they even tried to understand about these immigrant groups. And as a result of that, I don't know how many of you are aware that in the 1920s, I'll be interested how many of you are aware, they were burning crosses in Virginia. If you had a Ku Klux Klan group up here. Because when we were interviewing people in the 1980s, they remembered. And let me just read you something again from this book. Because that, that surprised me. Let's see. The huge torch rallies of the 20s Clan filling ballparks and picnic grounds, the Jesse Lake encampment, couples sparking and Model T's on the hills above Larkin kids, mom and dad, grandpa and gram in bedsheets, burning righteous crosses across the range, native speakers all, or those who blended well, shouting Catholics, kikes, and anarchists, fire in the long jack bones. That's the, that is the black moment here. Not only in Virginia, it was all over the nation. What happened, I, the Klan died by the 1895, it was gone. But then a film was made. How many of you are aware of the film Birth of a Nation? Well, Birth of the Nation celebrated the Klan in 1915 when it came out. And that's when the Klan, the Klan that we know today, that we talk about, that's when the Klan was reborn. Why? If this sounds like it's today, it is. Fear of immigration. Fear of people of color. Because do you know, in Minnesota, people from Eastern and Southern Europe were considered black. I don't know how many of you realize that. There was a doctoral dissertation written in the 1920s at the University of Minnesota where Virginia was described as the only white city on the Iron Range. <clears throat> Why was it the only white city? Because it was here that many of the mine owners and operators, in other words, those Northern Europeans and those Eastern people from the East Coast, the Yankees, lived. Hibbing was considered the blackest of all the cities because so many miners lived in Hibbing. So we have to kind of remind ourselves that what crisis we're going through now happened back there in the 1920s. Only the people of color look like us. And the only reason we were considered people of color 
is because of where we immigrated from. Sound familiar? Why don't we learn? But anyway, what happens here on the, and I must say, the range had a great deal of culture, which also surprised my students. You had opera houses, you had theaters, you had pro music, music on the range. I have to tell you, Vita, I mean, that was so important. I couldn't get over how much, the importance that music has played. You had all of that going on here. You guys brought up some of the finest musicians. You brought up some of the finest theater. People are always surprised when I tell them, what are you talking about? There was a great deal of culture. Mrs. Roman, whose window is over, right, over, right, right over here is the Roman, she was, she was kind of had a salon in which she had all these cultured guests coming, not, not just Jews, but people from all through, throughout the community. You had so many organizations, clubs, and the patriotism here, the 4th of July celebrations that they used to have up here were amazing. And the Stone family and the Milovitz family and all these other names that you see here, the Elstein family, all participated in these events. Well, what happens with the Stone family, you know, comes the, we've got the Ku Klux Klan, then comes the Depression, which hit the range hard but didn't hit the Jewish community too hard. They only lost about 10% of their population because people still needed goods and the Jewish people were able to provide them. I'm just gonna backtrack a minute because there's something else that was happening here. You had a lecture about the strikes, didn't you? That happened here. Those are important for me to mention because the Jews were in a very uncomfortable position when it came to the labor issues. Why? because the Jews were very pro-labor. They really leaned to the left, <laughs> to be very honest, very supportive of labor. But on the other hand, their customers were not only miners, they were mining operators. So they had to kind of balance, walk that tightrope, you know, back and forth being very sympathetic to the miners, but also recognizing who was allowing them to have their stores on Main Street were the mining companies. So they were not always in a comfortable position, but one man, Jewish man that we interviewed, whose family had a cigar making business in Chisholm, I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but he, he, he said he was the second largest employer on the Iron Range, because he had like 25 employees. The, the mining companies had all the rest, he had 20. He said, and he said, we just had to say, what was good enough for US Steel was gonna have to be good enough for us, because we had to deal with both the worker and the mining company. So that was an important point to be, to be understood. So the Stones, the Edelsteins, the Milovitzes, they all survived the uh, Depression. Uh, the Edelstein two sons and their two daughters all went to the beautiful Hibbing High School that Reader's Digest proclaimed, you know, the Palace High School, the greatest high school ever built in the United States. And then uh, Florence went to Duluth and she married a young man from Duluth who's in the first. Not Florence. Florence's daughter, Lindy, went to Duluth in 1934 and married a young man there who was in the town who was in the state of Florida. I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. Because that family circle is just so typical. She married a kid, they lived in Duluth for a while, they had two sons, and then he moved, and they moved to him where he worked in his brother's compliance store that was on Howard Street. Now, I had one of my students was able to interview Vicki. Uh, and we have a wonderful interview with her, which I can't have all the time, but that was the listen to she put such prescriptions on it. But she talks about her life growing up on the underground. I think what her life was was typical of many young Jewish people growing up in the 20s and 30s about the Iron Range. Well, to make a long story short, B in her interview, and we've heard the same thing from other people we interviewed as well, said that 
you know, she had many friends, both Jewish and Christian, that she would go to church on a Christmas Eve with her friends, but then she'd have them over on Hanukkah for potato latkes. She felt, you know, that the, the communities, you know, integrated well with one another. The children got, that her two brothers, incidentally, did marry non-Jewish women, which is interesting, but Bidi and her sister did not. But she also said something that resonated with me. She said, I often felt like I was living in two worlds, that I was wearing two hats, because I was Jewish, I belonged to a synagogue, I belonged to a particular ethnic and religious group, but at the same time, I was an Iron Ranger. I mean, that was an identity that all of you shared in common. So she had this identity as an Iron Ranger, but also this very specific identity as somebody who was Jewish, who was one of the outsiders, the outlier, if you know what I'm trying to say. And it's, when she had her oldest son, Robert, Bar Mitzvah, who his aunt told me that he chanted the prayers like an angel. I have to take her word for that. <laughs> uh, when her, her oldest son was bar mitzvah, they had the dinner at the Androy Hotel on Howard Street. 350 people were at that dinner. I bet you remember it. <laughs> and did he sing like an angel? I, I must know that. <laughs> You don't remember that. But you know, what happened though is because of your fine educational system, many of your children went on to college, didn't they? They became professional people. And a lot of them didn't come back to the range. And the range was going through a difficult time, weren't you? You know? Iron ore was playing out. Taconite was just really beginning to be discovered and reused and used. And there was an exodus from the range. And what we found then is what was happening when I came here in the 80s. These kids were beginning to leave. They were beginning in the 60s, actually, to beginning to leave. And that's what happened to Beatty and Abe's two sons, Robert and David. They both went down to the University of Minnesota. David, as some of you know probably, uh, was a music teacher, actually had a degree in music. Robert, he's still on the road. He's still looking for a home, isn't he? But what's interesting about Robert, about Bobby Dylan, if you listen to his lyrics, if you read his lyrics, wearing two hats, living in two worlds, his experience here on the range can be found in his lyrics. His music, I'm not an authority. I'll let you discuss his music. <laughs> okay. but, his, but as far as a writer, as being able to capture the zeitgeist, you know, the, the feeling of a moment, a period of our history, I think he did it. But I think he was able to do it because of this, because of you people, because of this great mosaic that he grew up in, what he was exposed to here on the range. I think had an enormous impact in his ability to express what he does so eloquently, I think, in the lyrics to his music. So that's why I love all of you. I love the Iron Range. I love your magnificent mosaic. And I pray that it will continue to be magnificent for generations yet to come. Thank you. questions. If I can't have an answer, I'll make up a great one. <laughs> maybe it's not really a question, but maybe you can um, sort of expand on this. Um, I had an old friend named Simon Borgen, and um, may he rest in peace, he yeah. died a few years ago, but his father came over from Russia, and I don't know how he made it to Ely, but and this would have been before 1900, a little bit before. Yeah, a, a lot of them came in the 1890s, yeah. Yeah, and he came up 
and illegally traded furs with the Ojibwe. That's right. And then he would send them to Duluth, sell them in Duluth, and um, he made enough money to bring his wife over, and then he had a business, you know, a clothing business. And um, was it his son who became a, a something in the State Department or in government? Son, yeah. Yes, I remember that name. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is not unusual. This, uh, what she's talking about, this trading with the Native Americans, they, the ones who came over early in the 1880s, they were still doing the beaver trade. You know, beaver hats were very popular. And th let me tell you something about the occupations the Jews were allowed in, because they were considered disgusting. One of them was furs, slaughter of animals and skinning of furs. Vermin Buckskin, how many of you are familiar with that's a big uh, leather comp Jewish leather company? It's because the other one was, believe it or not, was alcohol. There is a ditty in a dissertation that was written about anti-Semitism in Minnesota that goes, you should forgive me, but it goes, a thousand Jews are making booze for 10,000 Scandinavians. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, that was considered as a despicable profession, you know, making booze, but it was okay if the Jews. And the Jews, by tradition, now things have changed, were not big drinkers. And I think the reason they, they drank their kosher wine, but if you ever taste the kosher wine, it's about 2% alcohol, and the rest of it's all sugar. <laughs> so, but they, they were never uh, big alcohol drinkers. And I think it was because they knew the effects that alcohol had on people. Yeah, that's a good question, but I remember the Morgan family, yes. Any more? Come on, I'm here. Well, I'll be wandering around. You can, you can uh, come and talk to me. I'd love to have it. But again, thank you, and I'm so thrilled to be back here. Thank you, Vita. Did ah. they change their names Pardon me? I'll tell you a wonderful story. If you knew some of these Jewish names, you'd understand why. There was a story about this Jewish man who was going to customs, and he finally got it was time for him to, the customs guy said, okay, so what's your name? And he said, if you know Yiddish, he said, oh, Shane Ferguson, which means I forgot. So his name is now Shane Ferguson. <laughs> Uh, some of these names, well, like Solomonovich, I mean, they, these were mouthfuls of names. Uh, the Jalowski family, now Jalowski sounds difficult. The, the name originally was Yalowski. Now my name, Shyat, actually is pure, but it's not Yiddish, it's Hebrew. And the name is actually pronounced Hayat. And what does it mean? It means to cut. And what does that tell us? Somewhere in the past, somebody was a tailor, because Jews are also tailors. I'll tell you a good story about that. My mother-in-law, who was in the garment industry, she said, of course we were tailors, because when we were chased out of the ghetto, it was easier to carry a needle and thread with you than anything else. So you could always take the tools of your trade, which was a needle and thread. Think about it. <laughs> yeah. Any others? That was a good question. <laughs> Yeah, that, they did change their names. And some of it, of course, was for preservation, self-preservation. I've been going through some of my grandfather's papers. Pardon me? I've been going through some of my grandfather's papers. Yeah. When they left the Lithuania, there's evidence that their name was Ash, A-A-S-C-H. And then somehow they picked up the name Frisch. Oh. And I don't know exactly where that came from. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, these people were speaking Yiddish, and trust me, that when they were going through, you know, the customs, there was nobody there who could figure out what those names were. You know, that seven years before the rest of the family, and then their name was different. If they were named after a city, then it was often easier. You know, it was a year because a lot of times you know. A lot of people didn't have last names. I don't know if you're aware of this, until the early 19th century when Napoleon did a census. They said, hey, you guys, you know, we, we need, you can't just be constantly being the son of, you know, you've got to have a last name. And so they would take the name of their occupation. That's why you have a lot of Jews with the name Gold or Silversmiths, because Jews did a lot of uh, 
And there was another story why Jews did jewelry. I could quickly tell you because of the laws of usury. You know, in Christianity, you could never sell gold for more than what its value was as a piece of gold. So if somebody was making jewelry, but the Jews didn't have laws of usury. So they became goldsmiths because they could sell the jewelry at more than the value alone of the piece of gold that it was made out of. All these are wonderful little stories how you got your names, or else they took the name of the city they came from, or the shtetl they came from. Yeah. So, and the names some have meanings sometimes too. You know, the Rothschilds. It was the red shield they had in front of their building, their house. That's how the Rothschild family got their name. More questions? Oh, I see one back here. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, what did you say? I, I might have misheard what you said, but did you say there was a Libba Theater on Chestnut Street in Virginia? Another? L L Libba Theater. It was on, uh, no, it was on Chestnut Street, the Libba Theater. The Mako was a Libba. Your Mako Theater. The only Libba I know was in Hibbing. On, yeah, you know, the, the Libba was in Hibbing. The Libba was in Hibbing that I know. And yes. Did they also have one in Virginia? They had state, the state theater was in Virginia, wasn't it? I will talk to this is a family. Her father operated. Yeah. yeah. My family had the Granada for years. Yeah. And we the so family theater. And the Mako was a corporate theater. And what I learned as I was getting older, not when I was a kid, Mako means Minnesota Amusement Company. And, and by the time I was starting to go to college, I won't tell you the year, but at the time I was starting to go, then my family bought because the corporate world wanted out of here. Yeah, but so there was no Libba in Virginia. No, 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 okay, the Libba was in Hibbing. Right. Thank you. Get that. Thank you. I okay. <laughs> got that straight. <laughs> Which is now Sunrise Bakery. Pardon me? The Libba is Sunrise Bakery. Yeah. No, I was wondering what happened it to it. Yeah. <laughs> My dear friend here. <laughs> oh, Lita, are you? Since we're talking about immigration and so on, I've always been interested in census reports and that kind of thing. And so I sort of know everybody who lived in Aurora from the 1895 Minnesota census in 1900 and so on. It was town of white, then it became Aurora. And I remember kind of most of the names or many of the names. And one day I got, an, uh, uh, not an email, um, a Text. little pamphlet oh. from B'nai Abraham, your newsletter. And it said, Jewish football player from Aurora, I'm sorry, from Virginia, and his name was George Abramson, mm -hmm. talking about this Jewish football player who played for the University of Minnesota, was a big star, and then went on to, to become a star with the Green Bay Packers, at least to have a couple of seasons with the Green Bay Packers. And I thought, mm, hmm, I recognize that name, and I don't think he's from Virginia. I think that guy was in Aurora. So I went back and scoured the census reports. I, you know, I spent too much money on Ancestry.com. So sure enough, George Abramson was born in Evlith, and then his family around 1906, Move. came to Aurora and they ran a saloon, as you've said, they were alcohol, you know, there were some Jewish saloons in Aurora, early, early, early days. And in following him through, I saw that he was living above the store in 1919, or it would have been the 15th yeah. census, or 1920 census, of somebody named Morris Wiener, who it turns out had a big clothing store in Minneapolis, finally moved back there. And in that same building was another Jewish kid, uh, named Dave Simon. So I traced all about George Abrahamson, the football player. We I actually get this contacted more. his family. <laughs> and I, I said, you have no reason to talk to me, but I'm so interested, you know, and, and so on. And we're trying to do a sports hall of fame and he belongs in it and so on. His family lives out in LA. Then when I was done with that, I said, who is Dave Simon? And here's the story. He 
shows up first in the censuses. Actually, his father does, and his mother, Fanny and Morris Simon, who was a cigar maker in Duluth. Then they come to Virginia, and what's fascinating about it is they're living in some rooming house or some saloon, upstairs of a saloon, since mm -hmm. he's a cigar maker. In the house is a violinist, is a pianist, is a singer, mm -hmm. and then many, many, many demimondes. You know what's a demimonde? Yeah, yeah. Girl of the evening, right? Yeah. So that's where they're living in about 1900. Then the next thing I find out is they're living in Brighton Township, which is the coldest place in the world, isn't it? On the way to Ely. What could be colder than living in Brighton Township in 1902 or something like that? Or living up here. Yeah. And there were four <laughs> children, three children, three boys, one of whom is David. I think the ages were four and three and two, something like that. By the 1905 census, you find Fanny Simon, and she's buried in the Arnold Jewish Cemetery outside of Duluth. Oh, but yeah. no mention of the children. Morris shows up in Duluth, remarried to somebody from the range. Cecilia, give me some names. Who up were some famous? Caner. Maybe it was a Caner woman. Caner Cannon. Yeah, we're one of those. Milovich. <laughs> so what happened to these kids? Well, I trace it. I actually find Dave Simon's widow, who was in her late 80s at that point, living in California. We had the most wonderful conversation. And she said, Vita, there weren't three boys, there were four boys. What happened was, the three boys were old enough to go to the Jewish orphanage in Cleveland. Oh. So the children, the boys are put on the train and they yeah. go to live at the Jewish orphanage. So they show up on the Cleveland census reports. What happened to the fourth one that I didn't know about? He was too little to send. Cecilia had three daughters and they just couldn't manage six children. So they sent the boys away. And then when the littlest one was old enough, he joined the brothers there. Can you imagine how sad is this story? And they didn't see the, the father until 15 years later, they came back or 10 years later. And Dave Simon ended up on the second floor of a building in Aurora. I mean, that's how they started. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, these, these oh, personal sure. stories, it was so hard being an immigrant. Yeah. I mean, we, can't, we just can't imagine it, what it must have been like to, to, yeah. to and go and, and pump water in the 40 below zero weather. That's what I'm saying. It, 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 yeah. Coming so up anyway, here. I wanted to share that story, because that's, that's, that's one that touches me. Every time I drive to, to Ely, I think about <laughs> Fanny living there in the cold. Well, I remember. <laughs> My mother lived in the Jewish orphanage. Oh. We, 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 we forget how impoverished, you know, people have an image, unfortunately, of, of Jews, you know, being comfortable. No, 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 no. They're, 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 and if so, are, that, that is not the case at all. They came here from Eastern Europe penniless, literally penniless, because they had a flea with only what they could carry in one cloth bag. And trust me, they didn't have gold sold, sold into the skirts as some people like to think. These were very poor people. You, you don't become a junk dealer or a rag picker because that's an ideal profession to go into, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it's a story I think all of your parents and grandparents, they managed, they worked hard, and they finished. When they came over, did they have to be I'm sorry, whoops. Sponsored by somebody who lived here? Well, there was, yeah, allegedly, that's why they said one relative would get here. There was a Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, there was a couple of Jewish organizations, B'nai B'rith was another one, who, yeah, said that we could find them a job. I went through all of their letters, I went to Boston to the Jewish archives. These letters are heartbreaking, you know, saying, please, you know, could somebody. Could you find somebody you know, to say that they would be my... Yes, my grandfather came over from uh, Slovakia. Yeah. And he came over in 1900, but his wife, my grandmother, didn't come over for 10 years because he had to sponsor her. He couldn't sponsor her because he wasn't a citizen yet, so she had to be sponsored by a cousin in Ohio, or yeah. Illinois. Yeah, and so that, yeah, they were, they were always searching for somebody to... But that's why we're so interested to find out who were the very first ones who brought over, you know, almost a thousand. 
recognize that Minnesota never had a large Jewish population. It's larger now than it ever was, but at that time, there were probably 15,000 Jews in the whole state. So a thousand of them up here, you know, it was pretty impressive. So, okay, well, thank you all. What yes. Are the, what, are the what are the numbers now on the IRA? About 35,000, 35 to 45,000.